Does, does. All right, we're going to play five now. I'm going to take two real quick. Cross. There's G. All right, we'll get ready to go. Fucking have your attention. Sweet man. Of yeah. course you're here. Can we squeeze you in, brother? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Just settle in where you're at. You're star of the show, show man. We need you. Need you. Have First of all, you guys know me. I'm Mr. Baldwin. And this is a very rare opportunity. Rarely can we get the whole school to be involved in assembly, and today's one of those days. We're lucky today to have two great presenters that I think you're going to have a lot of interest in. So I'm going to read a little script. It's going to tell you something about it, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Once I get quiet. Thank you. Today we have a couple of outstanding presenters who will be connecting some of the work that you have been doing in one hour, focused on building relationships with some other important messages about avoiding risky behavior and substance abuse that will help you shape the future. The first one is John U. Bacon. He's a lifelong Ann Arbor resident who received his undergraduate and master's degrees from the University of Michigan. John has worked the better part of two decades as a writer, a public speaker, radio commentator, college teacher, and high school hockey coach, winning awards for all five. He has authored or co-authored eight books on sports and business. He then researched and wrote a trio of books covering big time college athletics from the inside out. All three were New York Times bestsellers. Will Hagerup was a part of the Michigan Wolverines. He holds a Michigan single season punting yard average record, as well as three of the top 10 single season records. Prior to committing to U of M in 2009, Will had received 20 Division I scholarship offers. However, at times during his U of M football career, he was suspended from the team for violations of team rules. In 2014, he was an All-Big Ten Honorable Mention selection. Will graduated from U of M in 2014 and currently is pursuing a career in advertising and sales at Fox Network. Without further ado, please give a proud point of welcome to John U. Bacon and Will Cogger. Coach, very much. I want to give a lot of thanks to the uh, Hornets here today. This took about four or five months of planning, believe it or not, to make all this happen. And a lot of thanks go to Joel Benedict. Uh, Joel and I go back to the fourth grade. He's got a lot of stories. Trust me, they're all false. Uh, we've got Julie Halbert, of course, Dr. Halbert. I've known her for almost as long, about 20 years, doing a great job here at Celine. Steve Latch, Chief Heft, um, and of course, the Celine Area Substance Abuse Council. So thanks to all of you, and thanks to you for all your. Uh, attentiveness, and uh, respect. And trust me, Will Hoggrub will tell you stories that will stay with you for a long time. I've known Will from a few different places. I first met him. He was being recruited by Michigan back in 2009. I was inside the program to write a book called Three and Out. So for three years, the coaches meetings, the weight room, you name it, I was inside the whole thing. And a Sunday afternoon film session after breaking down the Indiana game, which they had won, uh, the, the door opens to the coaches room. The door never opens to so the coach's room. They're breaking down tape. So it had to be big news. And Coach Rodriguez says, what is it? He says, just come out here. We get out there, and it's Will Hagerup, who decided at that moment, uh, ahead of schedule, to commit to Michigan instead of 20 other schools who wanted him. He was the nation's top punter uh, nationwide. Pretty impressive. So that was a big moment for those guys. I knew Will then, a little more fresh face back then. I didn't have to shave, I don't think, at that point, but there you go. Uh, then I had him in my class as a freshman, then I had him in my class again as a senior, and then this last year, when I had to leave the Sling graduation a little early, I had to go home and finish a book I'd written about Michigan football, End Zone, The Rise, Fallen, The Turn of Michigan Football, where the main player character is Will Hagerup. We sat down probably four or five times for about 20 hours to get his life story. He was brutally honest with himself. He was always straightforward, told the truth. It was often painful. We both got choked up at various points when he's telling me about all the ups and downs of his college career. He's going to tell you about that today to make sure you don't have to do what he did 
uh, to find out where you want to be. It's in a great place now, of course, working for Spock Sports in Chicago, becoming a rising star already. Might be on camera soon as well. Uh, but without further ado, I want to introduce my good friend, Will Hagara. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me come speak today. Um, this is an honor for me. Um, thank you to Professor Bacon for the introduction. I took a few of Bacon's courses, as you heard. Um, Passed the first course, I don't know why I took the second one. He's a, he's a tyrant. So, um, I want to start off with a story, and, and first of all, I want to address the elephant in the room, which some of you probably know what today is. Um, today is April 20th. Today is also 420. No, 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 no. That's, I think you're missing the All point right, of the can we get some cops anyway. in here to arrest everybody? But seriously, I, I appreciate the irony of, of me speaking here today on this issue. Um, so bear with that. And it's actually a segue because nine years ago today, on 420, I was 15 years old. I was a freshman in high school. And my friends and I had spent most of the day, it was a Friday, um, celebrating the holiday. And we were walking back after a night hanging out in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, which is uh, not unlike Celine. There's not a lot to do at night, so we spend most of our nights hanging out at Starbucks, believe it or not. But um, we were walking back to my friend Cooper's house, and in my pocket, my cargo short pocket, back when it was cool to wear cargo shorts, I had a glass pipe. I had just bought it a couple days before. And we're walking, we're nearing his house, we're walking through a parking lot, and we see a group of friends we knew from church youth group. There's about eight of them, six or eight of them. One of them was uh, Chris, one of them was Mike. And we briefly said hello, and I noticed that Mike was smoking a cigarette, and he's 15 too, so. Um, just as we were walking away, a cop car zipped into the parking lot with his lights flashing. And I knew something was about to happen. So he, the cop zipped in, he gets out of the car, and he says, when I drove by, there was a cloud of smoke around this group. What's going on? Who is smoking? None of you are of age. And none of us said anything. And he said, does anybody have anything on them that I should know about? We said, no, sir. In other words, we lied. So he says, well, to be sure, I'm going to search all of you. So please line up over here. I'm going to search you. So... I figured that I would line up on the far end. Hopefully he would start searching the other end and I could buy some time. This pipe is way in my pocket. I'm standing next to Mike, who had actually been smoking the cigarette, and the cop begins his search with the first person. And I, I whisper to Mike, I said, Mike, please give him your cigarettes. He's going to find them anyways. I have a pipe for you, please. He didn't say anything. He's scared, too. So the cop finishes searching the first guy, finds nothing. He goes on to the second guy. My heart's racing. He finishes searching the second guy. And finally, Mike hoists the cigarettes up from his pocket and says, Officer, the cigarettes are mine. I'm so sorry. The cop arrests him, gets his information, and to me, it's over. I, I thought I was in the clear. We'd you know, go to school on Monday like normal, and we'd probably have a good story to tell. And at that point, he said, does anybody else have anything on them I should know about? And we all shook our heads, no, sir. And he said, well, just to be sure, I'm going to search the rest of you. So now I'm really scared. 
Because if he comes and searches me, all he has to do is pat me down and I'm done. So I'm standing on the left side of this group. He finishes searching the third person. And I notice out of the corner of my eye, there's a, an area like a garden, a blade of grass uh, area. And if I reach into my pocket and toss the pipe, I could probably land it in this grass area without him <laughs> noticing, being conspicuous about it. And I could probably come pick it up the next day if I wanted to. It's probably not going to break. So, being that it's my last option, I very carefully reach into my pocket and grab the pipe. Cops over there searching. And I toss it. And it's in midair, my heart's stopping. And all of a sudden, I hear the loudest smash I think I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> The pipe had shattered on a nearby fence. I missed the garden by that much. Everybody immediately looked over. Everybody could hear it. The cop immediately looked over, flashed his light, walked over, grabbed a couple of larger broken segments, and came back over. And he was not as nice this time. He screamed at us. Whose pipe is this? Who did this? At that point, I had to confess. I said, I'm sorry, sir, it's my pipe. He slapped handcuffs on me, really tight, threw me in the back of the cop car, and I'm, I'm so nervous, I'm shaking. And if you've never been in the back of a cop car before, you think a lot about your parents, and you think a lot about your future. And at that point, I didn't know how either would be affected. So he took me to the police station, which is nearby. Everything in Whitefish Bay is close by, but he put me in one of the cells. I'm 15 years old. For four hours, I waited in one of the cells. And the worst part was around 10 p.m. I could hear my confiscated cell phone in the other room ringing and ringing and ringing. I was past curfew. My mom was calling, wondering where I was. So I hear it ringing basically constantly. And then finally, two hours after that, my dad came to pick me up. And that was just not a fun conversation to have with my dad on our walk home. On that point, uh, looking back on that one, what were the takeaway points from that 15-year-old experience? The takeaway points for me were how fast you can get into trouble. I mean, we were walking home, we were having a good time, and we weren't going to be the ones smoking in public, right? We thought we were smart about it, but my friends were. And ultimately, the cops stopped us because of my friends, and it happened so fast. Um, the other takeaway, I think, is that as a 15-year-old, my parents and everybody around me wanted me to figure things out. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't the end for me. I could still get over it. After being grounded for a couple months, I was able to sort of get out of it. So your tonic there was football, especially punting. You found something you're passionate about, and you ended up being very good at this. Tell us about your commitment to the art of punting. Well, after I had been arrested and I was going into my sophomore year, I knew that I had to become good at something. I didn't feel like I was that good at anything. I mean, I played sports a little bit. I was into music, but I felt like I had to become something great. And because my brother had success as a punter and had been scholarships to Indiana, I thought that maybe I could follow suit. And so I decided, decided that I would work on punting, that I would get better at it, that I would commit to it, and that's what I did. I, I worked on punting every single day. If it was snowing outside, I literally went to my field and I shoveled snow off big enough to where I could punt the football. And I really fell in love with it my, my sophomore year, and, and the more I did it, the better I got. And by your senior year, you are in fact the best high school punter in the nation. 20 schools are after you, including Wisconsin, the home school, as well as Indiana, where your brother is going. Uh, but in, Michigan got into your heart somehow or other. How did Michigan make the sale? Well, I, after my second visit to Michigan, 
Um, I knew that it was a special place. I knew that it had academics that rivaled any school. It had athletics that rivaled any school. It had a campus that rivaled any school. And beyond that, it just felt like I was falling in love with something. It was sort of hard to explain. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be in Michigan, and I, I was willing to do anything to be there. So you're about to leave back on Sunday morning back to Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin. The recruiting trip is over. He's got to go to a few more schools, but he tells his parents, no, we're going to stay here right now. We need to go back immediately to Schimbecker Hall and close the deal. Tell us that a little bit. Well, I, I told my parents that I'm ready to commit, and they said, oh, we'll go home. It's sort of all over. I said, no, I want to commit right now. And my mom gave me a big hug, my dad gave me a big hug, and we, uh, we went back to Schembecker Hall. And I asked the secretary if I could speak with Coach Rodriguez, and she said, of course. And I knocked on the door, and Coach Rodriguez came out, and he said, what's up, what's going on? And I said, Coach, I, I want to commit to Michigan, I want to be a Wolverine. And he immediately lit up, my parents were excited, and other coaches came out of the meeting room and jumped up and down. And it was just a wonderful experience when I remember very fondly. And that is the first time I met Will Hagerup. We had no idea that seven years later we'd be here on the stage talking to you guys, but that's how life works sometimes. Uh, then shortly thereafter, the next year comes in, you got a little cocky in Wisconsin, I believe, when you're back at home. You got a scholarship to Michigan, you're the best punter in the nation, and Will's habit is when things are going well, he thinks the normal rules don't apply. Yeah, I mean, if you found me at 18 in high school, I was probably the cockiest person you've ever met. I'm sure there's some of you out there today, but um, I thought I could do anything. I thought I was invincible. And I forgot about what had happened to me at age 15 because I thought I was smarter, I thought I was better. And I started smoking weed, getting high almost every single day because I figured I know where I'm going to school. I don't need to try that hard in school, I'm already in. And I can have some fun. I rationalized that I could have fun. And that's when I became really very good at deceiving people and telling people that everything is going really well when in reality I was developing some pretty serious habits. Then your first meeting with Dave Brannon as a freshman at Michigan in August. Before your first class, Dave Brannon was the athletic director at Michigan. I was there for this meeting. That side of the stadium, basically, that's about what the Michigan meeting room looks like, about 120 players and coaches. And Dave Brannon's right there talking to everybody, welcoming them in some way to Michigan, but telling them what is going to happen and what is not going to happen. And you recall that meeting very well. Yeah, well, the athletic director was a very formidable guy. He was very intimidating when he needed to be. And he made it clear in that meeting that drug use was not to be tolerated if you were a Michigan student athlete. If you wanted to do that, quit, be a regular student. But he made it clear that the first failed test, and there would be many tests, you'd be out for a game. The second failed test, you'd be out for four games. And the third failed test, you would be off the team completely. And that means losing your scholarship, which, by the way, if you're getting an athletic scholarship to Michigan, as he was, that is $50,000 a year that your parents do not have to pay out of state. So that's $200,000 in four years you're about to lose by your third drug test. So the stakes when you're in high school are one thing. As you get to college, it's getting more and more. And as you get older, of course, you lose your job or you go to jail. So things get very serious very quickly. But you've got a great freshman year, you're kicking very well, and near the end of the year, you're starting feeling pretty good again. Yeah, well, I'd, I had some friends visiting for the Wisconsin game, and I stayed pretty clean that whole year. Um, I was focused on football, and my friends offered me some weed. And I said, sure, what can go wrong? They're not gonna drug test us before the Ohio State game, come on. So I did, and a couple days later, after our Tuesday practice, they told me that I had a drug test, and I immediately started chugging water, trying to sort of clear my system out. 
and I chugged so much, I think I ended up throwing up, but an hour later I took the test, and a couple days later, they called me in and told me that I had failed the drug test. I'm a freshman at the University of Michigan and I had failed the drug test. And that was a really scary experience. It was, I was embarrassed and I knew that people would know that I was suspended for the Ohio State game, the greatest rivalry there is. And, um, I, was, I was frankly embarrassed of myself. Um, and I was embarrassed to tell my parents that I had failed. I was embarrassed to tell my friends I had failed. And instead of boarding the buses to go play Ohio State, I went back in Milwaukee with my, with my family. And my friend and I went to Buffalo Wild Wings to watch the Ohio State game. And during the game, the announcer, this is national TV, says, Hagrup suspended for violation of team rules. This is after our backup hunter had kind of shanked one. And my phone immediately starts blowing up with Facebook messages from fans saying, you know, this loss is your fault and all this negative energy from them. And, and by the way, if you're a public figure, you get a lot worse than that. You got hundreds upon hundreds of Facebook messages, emails, tweets and whatnot, and some of these were quite nasty, correct? Mm -hmm. That's right, and I think the worst part was that right after he announced that, the lady sitting near us faced us and she said, do you know why Hogrope is suspended? And I sort of chuckled and I said, actually, I'm him, and yes, I know why I'm suspended. Um, and it turns out that she had just moved across the street from my parents, so I see her every day when I come home and visit. But it was an embarrassing experience, to say the least. So you missed that game. Then, of course, Rich Rodriguez, whose kids went to school here, Raquel and Rhett, uh, they leave Ann Arbor. Brady Hope comes in. Uh, you got a new coaching staff. What happens next? Well, when a new coaching staff comes in, they're going to try and weed out, no pun intended, they're going to try and weed out the weak players on the team, so to speak. So they want guys to essentially quit. So they develop workouts that are so hard that hopefully a few guys each week quit the team. And these workouts were so difficult and my class schedule was so difficult that semester. And I remember going to bed at midnight after studying or doing homework and knowing that I had to wake up at five for workout and just being exhausted. And by the way, being a Michigan football player, no matter what the NCAA rules are, they put in about 40 hours a week on their sports. I had to try this out during when I was writing that book, the first one that involved Will. Uh, Denard Robinson, a good friend of mine, a good friend of yours too, he's called me the Baconator, because that was his favorite meal at Wendy's. Uh, he said, you gotta do what we're doing. I said, what do you mean? He said, the weight room. So for six weeks, during the spring of 2009, before Will gets there, I worked out with the football team. I puked for about a week and a half. I'm not kidding, it was like death, but slower and louder. That is a typical day for these guys. It is a brutal existence in many ways. When I asked Devin Gardner, the quarterback, what would you be if you were not a Michigan quarterback? He thought about it and he said, an A student. He said, because the guys are going against you guys, basically. You guys can all pull all-nighters when you go to Michigan. It's not that big a deal. All right, we get about two to three hours of study a night if we're lucky. We cannot pull an all-nighter. If we pull an all-nighter, the next day we're going to get crushed, either in the weight room or on the football field, by guys who've slept. So it just can't happen. So you had to avoid this, though. You had two big exams coming up, two midterms. So what to do? Well, I knew that I was going to have to stay up late and study. And I knew that a lot of the guys in my, my dorm, um, non-athletes, took Adderall to stay up and study. And so I decided the night before a bio exam, an econ exam, and a football workout that I better, I better avoid sleeping. I got a lot of work to do. So I took an Adderall. I stayed up until 4 a.m. At 4 a.m. I walked after getting kicked out of the academic center by a custodian. I walked across the street and changed clothes, went over to our workout facility, went through a two-hour workout, and then went and took my two exams. No sleep. And I ended up doing well on the exam. 
Problem was that after the second exam, I got a call from our trainer saying that I needed to take a drug test. You are not a lucky guy, are you? Very unlucky when it comes to this, but I walked over and I knew I was going to fail. I knew it. By the way, ADD drugs, Adderall, you guys can take them. If you're a student at Michigan, nobody cares. If you're an athlete at Michigan and you don't have a prescription for Adderall, you have broken the drug laws, the drug rules. So he has therefore violated the same way he would have if he had gotten high. So I knew that I had failed immediately. And I tried to say, well, it's not a serious drug. I wasn't doing it to have fun. I was doing it to be successful in the classroom. But that didn't fly. I had to walk into Coach Hoke's office, whom I really didn't know that well. He'd only been there for a few weeks. And I had to hear him say that I was going to be suspended for the first four games of the upcoming season. But that's not all. That's not all. That, that part I could deal with on a level. The, the worst part was that his policy with the drug tests, he's a new coach, his policy is that a failed drug test means 30 straight 5 a.m. workouts with our strength staff by yourself. So you're in West Quad, you're a freshman, the alarm clock goes off at what time? About 3.30 a.m. 3.30, it's still dark, cold out, it's the middle of the night. You gotta get up, uh, brush your teeth, and head on down to Schimbeckler Hall in the dark on the ice. Everyone else is still asleep. You gotta do it for 30 straight days, but that's not the hard part either. Well, I showed up the first day. It was snowing out, it was cold. I got there at about 4.15 a.m. I was 45 minutes early. And Coach Wellman, our head strength coach, he said two things. One, if you are a second late to any of these third workouts, you are immediately kicked off the team, no questions asked. And number two, go get a 45 pound plate from the weight room. So I didn't respond, I just went to the weight room, grabbed a plate, came back out. We got an indoor football field, and he said, you are going to push this plate there and back 10 times, 1,000 yards. You can't take your hands off the plate. You can't put your knees to the ground. You can't stop. And if you do? And if you do, you start over. And by the way, you got to demonstrate briefly what this looks like. I'm going to embarrass you for a second. Demonstrate a plate push. It sounds easy. You push a 45 pound plate, 100 yards. It sounds very easy. Show us briefly. I, okay, I don't want to rip my pants here, but basically, you're on all nice fours. Pants. You're, you're squatted down like that, and you push a plate across for a thousand yards. So you're bent over, you're pushing like this, and, after thir and you're in great shape at this point. You're a Big Ten athlete. After 30 yards, you're already having a problem. Yeah, after 30 yards, my legs were shaking. Um, I was feeling nauseous, and I wanted to drop to my knees, or I wanted to stand up and relieve my legs a little bit, but Coach Wallman said, don't you dare do that. So I kept pushing. I got through the first 100 yards, got through the first, got through the first 200 yards, 300, 400, 500. I'm halfway through 1,000 yards, and it's been 30 minutes already. And I just kept pushing. I knew there was really no option. I wasn't going to talk him out of it. I had gotten myself in this position. And finally, an hour later, I finished 1,000 yards. And I was like tearing up because it was so pain. My legs hurt so bad. And I finished, and I immediately dropped down to the ground. And he yelled at me, he said, get up. What are you doing? You're not done. So on top of that, he explained that I had 200 yards of log rolls. And like when you're a little kid, you roll down a hill and it makes you kind of dizzy. Well, I was 21 years old or 20 years old and it wasn't as fun. It made me nauseous, it, it made me vomit, and it essentially ruined the rest of my day because I felt sick the entire day. So after that workout, I knew because I had done just one that I was going to do all 30 because I'm not going to let that one go to waste.
So I walked back to my dorm, uphill on State Street, and it was still dark outside, there was still snow on the ground, and I basically was too, too upset to even fall asleep. So I basically just changed for class and went to a day of classes. Uh, then, of course, you get near the end, it's workout number 30, instead of an hour to finish 1,000 yards, you're in better shape at this point. Your last day of 30. Yeah, 30 days has arrived, and my, my parents, you know, called me the night before to congratulate me that I got through this. My teammates were congratulating me, and I knew I wanted to finish on a strong note. So I showed up extra early. I got the plate out of the weight room, and I essentially sprinted the 1,000-yard plate pushes. Um, I finished in like 13 minutes. I was a machine. I was a pro in these plate pushes. Um, and it was, a, it was a very good feeling to know that I had made some really awful mistakes, but that the coaches gave me a very tangible way of sort of making those right in their eyes. And I think I did that. So he finishes that. He's in good stead with Hulk again. The 2011 season starts. You guys were about 10 years old or so for that. You probably remember that season with Denard Robinson and so on. There you go, 11 and 2, including a big victory in the Sugar Bowl in New Orleans. He had a very good season. Uh, and then, of course, next year he has, has a great season. 2012, he ends up being the Big Ten Punter of the Year. It's his birthday, December 7th. He gets a text message from your brother, I believe. Or the office. Well, I, got a, I got a text message from the office saying that you were just selected as a Big Ten punter of the year. And I jumped out of my bed and was just so excited. I called my parents. I called my grandparents. I was very proud of myself. I felt that I worked really hard that season. I felt that I'd done my job, and, and I always wanted to be recognized as the best in the conference. And, and I was. And, and it's your birthday. And I'm about to turn 21. So going into that weekend, I hey, again hey, rationalized. Will, check it out. They're already groaning for you. <laughs> like, dude, don't do this. Don't do this. <laughs> so I stayed home and studied and worked on them. Um, so I, I felt that I owed it to myself to go out and have a really, really awesome time for my 21st birthday. I did. So I, my birthday was on a Friday. I think I celebrated with friends and teammates Wednesday through Saturday, essentially. And I had more fun on that campus than anybody has ever had in the history of Michigan, I promise. The problem was I was violating team rules again. But I thought there is no way that I'm just going to have fun for one weekend and they were gonna happen to find out. There's no way. Well, I showed up. We had a practice the day after my birthday. I showed up, and I think I probably looked like I had been having a good time a couple nights before, and I was tired, and my eyes were probably droopy and red, and they said, we're gonna make you take a drug test. And How'd that feel? That was just, it, that felt the same way that when the cop pulled into the parking lot when I was a freshman in high school, you just know that something's about to happen and you sort of prepare yourself for it. And I had to, I had no choice. So I took the drug test and I knew that I was probably going to fail. Two days later? Two days later. I get a text, this is a week after getting a text that I had been Big Ten punter of the year, and I get a text from the same person who texts me from the football office, in all caps, Coach Hoke needs to see you immediately. And I knew, I, I, I knew. I didn't know what to do about it, but I knew what was about to happen. So I walked over as slow as I could. I just wanted to make this process go by as slowly as possible. And I walked to his office, and this time felt much, much more serious than the previous two, two, two times. Because I'm going into my senior year, I'm gonna be a senior next year, I'm supposed to be a leader on the team. 
and I go into Coach Oak's office, and he looks like he himself had been tearing up. And I knew, I knew what he was going to say, and he said, "You failed your third drug test, and I'm heartbroken." And I just looked at him. I remember feeling this, this like numb feeling, like I literally couldn't move. And I didn't respond. I couldn't talk. I, I couldn't talk. I couldn't move. And he said, "You know, I look at you like a son. You know, I love you. But there's nothing I can do to help you here, really. You know what the rules are. I'm sorry." And I don't know if I cried for a minute or for an hour, but I think it remains the worst hour of my entire life. And I left his office and immediately went to see probably my biggest mentor, Greg Harden, who's the associate athletic director. Take a step back. Greg, really Greg's here too. today, actually. It's a great athletic counselor for U of M. I really appreciate you being here today. Now, the man's been on 60 Minutes for crying out loud. He's big time. Yep. And I knew that if anybody would be able to help me, it would be him. And I went over to see him and I said, can you talk? And he said, uh, I've got someone coming in a few minutes. And I looked at him. Because we know each other so well, he knew that it was very serious. So without even saying anything, without asking questions, he said, OK, I'll cancel the meeting. So I ended up staying in his office for, I think, like three hours. And we basically had to figure out how I got to this point. How do I go from? committing to play football in Michigan, hugging my parents, hugging coaches, to being basically left with no spot on the football team. People are upset with you. People don't trust you. You don't trust yourself. And we basically walked through everything. And no scholarship. No scholarship. I was off the team. And I had to figure out a way that I was going to pay for school, if I was even going to stay at school. And I had to figure out a way that I was going to tell my parents about this for the third time. And I sat in his office for hours, and we cried, and we, and we talked, and he said, and he's a, he's a resourceful guy, he's a strong guy, he said, I don't know what we can do here. Dave Brandon is not going to tolerate this. The athletic director is not going to tolerate this. And I, I, I think you've got to figure out what you, where you're going to go from here. So I went home that night, and I had to reflect a lot on, on where I was. And I got a text from my parents, who obviously didn't know what had happened. And it was terrible. It said, it's from my mom, it said, we have four people coming to the bowl game. Four of our friends were so excited to see you in a couple of weeks. And I read it and I just, I started crying. I didn't know what to do. I mean, my parents have been so supportive of me for my entire life and letting them down was just such an awful feeling. Then you have some choices. We've got about five minutes left. I can't leave you guys late for your next class. I have some choices there. And the obvious thing is you're off the team. You got to pay. $25,000 per semester to go to Michigan. They pay it for that semester. He keeps going to Michigan, and he starts looking at other schools, going to Indiana or Wisconsin, other schools. And then you, it occurs to him that Michigan was the place he always loved from day one, the day he hugged the coach and said, I'm coming here, and not the other 20 schools. He's determined to find a way to stay at Michigan. So he finishes that semester, and he's got to pay for school the following fall. There's no way he's back on the team. There's no way that he's going to be a, get a scholarship. So he works at a steel mill in Wisconsin all summer long. Brutal work. Tell us about that work briefly 
about working in a steel mill to pay your tuition. Well, I was going to be home for a summer while the team was practicing, and I knew I wanted to keep busy. I knew I wanted to avoid, frankly, people from my hometown asking questions about why I'd screwed up. So I decided I was going to work in a steel mill. So much like my 30-day punishment after the second strike, I woke up at 4 a.m. every morning for an entire summer and went and pounded steel for 10 hours a day. And nearing the end of the summer, I was going to be revisiting the team after putting in some, some work with counselors, putting some work in with the coaches. And one of the guys came up to me who had been there for 30 years. He'd been pounding steel his entire life. He said, this experience should show you how important your Michigan degree is and how important being a leader at Michigan is. And I'll never forget that. And I used that as fuel going into my senior year to be a leader, to be a guy that could go through what I went through, to ask for help when I needed to ask for help finally, and to ultimate, ultimately be a leader to the younger guys. Along those lines, you got help from Greg Harden, the G-man right there who's fantastic. You got counseling help as well, as well as help from Brady Hope. So when he finally needed help, he asked for help, and he got help to get things sorted out. You went to your first counseling session because you had to, and you had no interest in that whatsoever, but that changed pretty quickly. Yeah, I knew that that was something that I would just have to check off the list if I wanted to get back on the team. Like, I'll have to go see this lady, or I'll have to go see this person. But after my first couple meetings, I realized that I need to learn more about myself and what makes me create these issues over and over and over. And I decided that I was going to go see this woman a couple times a week for months. And at the end of our sessions, I realized it's not about getting back on the football team, because with or without football, I have to be able to live with myself. And I accomplished that. And she was really the key to all of that. She was the key to that. So was Dave Brandon. So was Greg Harden. Uh, incredibly, because they monitored your progress, they actually let Will back on the team after three strikes. This has never happened in the history, I believe, of Michigan football. And Greg is nodding at this. A lot of guys who want to take a huge chance at bringing back a punter on the team after three strikes. Greg Harden, Dave Brandon, Coach Hoke, they brought you back. How did it feel to see your locker room again, your name in the locker again after a summer beating steel in, uh, in Wisconsin? Well, I knew this was literally the last opportunity I would have. They, there was going to be no more strikes given. I knew that it was time to get to work. I was going to be a senior on the football team, and I had to be a leader. And I had to not just say I was going to do something and deceive other people as I'd done before, but I really had to become the person that I, that I was telling people I was. And it was a wonderful opportunity. It was very exciting to see my locker again. Uh, Will and I talked a lot during this time. We got choked up a few times, him telling the story. I could see how much he had grown during that time. Uh, I'm always happy to write a letter for Will to his next job. In the meantime, he's got a great job at Fox Sports in Chicago. And this summer, he's marrying the girl of his dreams. He now really is the man he said he was. So that's very impressive. I had a chance to see him grow up. The last three takeaways, go ahead for the students here. Three takeaways. Um, one is that you all have to find something to commit to. So whether that's, whether that's college or sport, you have to find something to commit to and stick with it. Second would be surround yourself with people who care about you. I know I had to rush through the story a bit, but ultimately the most important thing was that I had people around me that really cared about me. And finally is you need to ask for help. You know, you, sometimes you think that if I ask for help that it makes me look weak or makes me look like I don't know what I'm doing. But if you're struggling with something, whether it's a sport or whether it's school or whether it's an issue with a drug, ask someone for help. And the final thing I'll leave you guys with is that I know you're going to be doing these periods more often. I think it's a great idea. Before the next period like this, everyone in this school should have someone, whether it's a teacher or a coach, that they can go talk to 
when you feel like you have nothing left, like I did after my third strike, you need to have someone who will close their office door and sit with you for three hours and just let you be you for a little bit, explain the issues that you're having. So you need to all find someone that you can talk to like that. On that note, take good care of yourselves, take the message with you, and keep it track of Rojagra. Thank you very much. Go Hornets!